So first of all, let me thank all the speakers. Um, we are 30 seconds we have. So in, in these 30 seconds, I will explain you how we are going to proceed. Yeah? So the first thing is the following that we will have 20 minutes of talks and then 10 minutes of question and answer sessions. And in these 20 minutes of talks, uh, my preference is not to uh, interrupt you. So I will not interrupt you at all. So, and if there is a question here, as well as if there is a question in YouTube, we will take it only after the end of the talk so that there is no interruption and, and things like that. Good. With this, let me welcome all of our speakers. So Kiran, I would ask you to go first and then Manoj, and then at the end, we can ask uh, Mithun to go along. So my only request to the other who are uh, entering the room, please uh, switch off your uh, microphone so that uh, we uh, don't listen to the background noise. That's, that's the one thing. And as I mentioned previously, again and again, so um, you can ask questions just after that. Okay? So with this, uh, thank you for joining all of you. And let me uh, start uh, with uh, with uh, Kiran, who is from our bioscience department. He will talk about uh, coronavirus one on one. Kiran, it's up to you. Okay, so I will share my screen. Okay, can, can you all see my screen? Yes, you can see it. So it is also um, able to move back and forth, right? Yeah. Okay, great. So yeah, I have titled my talk as Coronavirus 101. Um, so before I, I, I tell you something about coronavirus, you know, all, all of you guys have been reading a lot about coronavirus, right? If you go to preprint server, probably you can can find 3,000, 4,000 articles, and you have been bombarded with all these newspaper articles, opinions, and everybody seemed to know everything about these viruses, right? So um, I, I thought, you know, instead of directly jumping into coronaviruses, I will just take a step back and, and, and you know, set the context for you uh, about the viruses themselves, right? So I will take about a few minutes to go through this. So this is the first slide. I, I, I'll just tell you what we do in the lab. Uh, we don't, obviously we don't work with coronaviruses and our, our research is more focused on understanding the evolution and biology of these large DNA viruses. And as you can see, we use vaccine virus and Mimi virus and, and you have this Pandora viruses that was discovered about seven years ago as, as laboratory uh, you know, prototypes. And we ask some of these questions, right? Are they alive? Which is again a billion dollar question in the field of virology. Uh, and the other things are more mechanistic, you know, in terms of understanding why they are so big. You know, some of these viruses are bigger than bacteria, right? How do they invade the host and how do they package protein, genome, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this is what we do. Now, as I said, right, I will take you through, uh, you know, set up some context for, for viruses themselves. So if you look at um, you know entire world, right? Almost all organisms, whether they can be bacteria, archaea, or or eukaryotes, they can be living in Antarctica. They could be living in the desert. You know, almost all organisms are infected by viruses. And if you look at the biological diversity of these viruses, right? They are they are they are incredible. And and most researchers, most microbiologists. Classical ones, anyway, you know, they consider viruses as non living simply because they lack metabolism and they don't divide like cells. And if some of you understand how, you know, the life cycle of viruses, right, they have this eclipse phase where they basically they disappear and suddenly you see a lot of progeny viruses coming out, right? So this is a clear distinction between cellular organisms and viruses. So this debate of you know whether viruses are alive or not has been going on for years, but notwithstanding any of that, you know viruses. We all agree that viruses are biological entities, and they undergo Darwinian uh, evolution, right? And and they are some of the simplest Darwinian machines. Of course, there are some naked DNA and RNA elements that also show this behavior. But but uh, but viruses can be considered as as some of the most simple and most elegant Darwinian machines, you know, machines. and they do more than cause uh, disease. I just don't want to go into all these details. 
uh, but since the emergence of um, all these drug resistance, bacteriophages could be the next generation drugs for, uh, for, for treating bacterial pathogens. Uh, this was one of the first papers that uh, uh, you know, I found on, on this debate of viruses or whether they are living or non-living. It dates back to 1938, as you can see. And this question has not been answered so far. I don't think it will ever be answered. Andre Loff, if some of you know him, he's a Nobel laureate. He did some, uh, some, some phenomenal work on understanding the genetics of viruses and how they synthesize uh, their genetic material. So he thought that whether viruses, uh, whether or not viruses should be regarded as organisms is just a matter of taste, right? Because this is a never ending debate and it comes down to opinion, right? So I will just take you through some amazing facts about these viruses. If you look at the bacteriophages, these are the viruses that infect bacteria. There are, these numbers are incredible. There are about 10 to 31 bacteriophages in the, you know, in oceans and seas. I don't know how someone has estimated that, but, uh, but that number kind of stands out. So, which means that for every bacteria in ocean, uh, there are probably at least 10 viruses that are lurking around to infect that particular bacteria, right? So, if you just pick up one ml of this water in, in, in oceans and seas, you would be picking up anywhere from a million to 100 million these virus particles, right? So these numbers are incredible. And now if you look at HIV genome itself, right? There are about 10 to 16 variants of HIV genomes are present on the face of this earth. And from the last 30 or 40 years of research on HIV genome, people are able to come up with the drugs or, uh, you know, for, for maybe about three or four of them. And, and because of the way HIV replicates its genome, uh, pretty much every nucleotide of its 10,000 10, 10, nucleotides are basically, in theory, uh, I know they can be mutated, right? So this can give rise to an incredible sequence diversity of whatever that number, right? 10 to uh, whatever, 6,000. And just to put this number into perspective, there are only 10 to 11 stars. And I don't know, somebody said that there are 10 to 80 protons in the universe. And you guys are the physicists. You have to tell me whether I'm right or wrong, right? But, but essentially, what I'm trying to tell you here is that just one virus, right, within, within, within a period of five to six years, um, it can diversify into so many different genomes. Uh, there are a lot of other very interesting evolutionary dynamics that go on, but I don't have time to go through all of them. And then if you look at the viruses, some of the smallest viruses have only about uh, one to two KB uh, uh, genome. As all of you know, viruses are the only biological entities that can have RNA um, um, you know, as their genetic material. And in this particular case, porcine circovirus, which in fact obviously picks, is, is one of the smallest viruses that has ever discovered. It's only about 17 nanometer in size, right? And some of the largest viruses, Pandora virus, this is about 2.5 MB double standard DNA genome. Uh, you see here, this is, this is how it looks. Uh, and this is bigger than many, many big bacteria, uh, several bacteria. And then these coronaviruses, right? So they have a huge 30 KB uh, single standard RNA genome, and they are the biggest or the largest uh, you know, RNA virus. One of the largest RNA viruses, and and you know if you go to again uh, these bacteriophages are the not the only viruses in oceans, and many of these large mammals and whales and and all the fishes they are infected with incredible number of viruses, and uh, whales basically shred about uh, you know about ten to thirteen viruses every single day, right? So their strength is in their diversity and abundance. Um, and, and what you are looking at here is the entire genome of porcine circovirus, and it looks something like this, right? So the entire genome can be synthesized and fitted in just one page, right? This is incredible. And then if you, if you want to look at how infected are we, I've, I've been talking about bacteria, I've been talking about whale, how about us, right? Human beings. And uh, I'm not exaggerating, each and every one of us, you know, uh, uh, you know, he's probably infected with at least two types of herpes viruses. It doesn't matter how many times you wash your hands and, you know, you know how many times you take, you take bath and things like that. 
and most of those belongs to herpes simplex virus family one and two and there are others this b virus hhv hhv8 there are some of the deadlier ones and most of these infections basically stay with us for life right there is there are no treatment no vaccine nothing works against them um, most of these remain dormant and whenever there is some issue with us and our immunity goes down the these viruses multiply and again they go back to the dormant state and then even if we look at our own genome right we have an incredible number of viral genomes that have been integrated into us so we have about 240000 copies of these retroviral genomes these are uh, the relatives of hiv virus they have been integrated into our genome and that constitutes about 8% of our total genome again this is an incredible number right and how do you you know compare this with 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 the coding region right the the, the genes that are there that code for protein or rna that accounts for only 1.5% so these viruses are there in our genome um even before the emergence of humans and now since we have the whole genome sequencing of all the primates that are available we can basically use them as a marker to study the evolution of human beings itself right so this has um, uh, you know led to emergence of a new entirely new field known as paleo virology right so this is this is something very interesting and just like all the animals you have been talking about bats we are no different we are also a reservoir of adenoviruses there are incredible number of adenoviruses on our body especially in our lungs and nose and we also carry several of these corona viruses uh, of course rhino viruses are there uh, everywhere as well and and we also are host to incredible number of bacteriophages in the gut right and most of these and uh, these viruses are there with us since our existence as as you can see here there is this phylogeny that i'm showing um this is basically the phylogeny of, of all the primates and this integration of of this retroviral these endogenous virus has happened some of them happened more than 30 million years ago right so this is this is something incredible so with this context in mind again this is just one last slide on this uh, there is one more virus which is known as transfusion transmitted virus some people call it as tarc teno virus and this 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 virus is uh, ubiquitous no if you go to some middle eastern countries like kuwait uh, you know every individual has this virus and in large number right and it's again a very small virus uh, 40 nanometer in size has about 3.8 kb genome nobody knows what it is doing um, it doesn't seem to affect the individuals in any way but there is some association with liver failure and things like that so in other words you know almost all living organisms including us whales you know you name it all of us are infected with multiple uh, types of viruses at any given point in time thanks to our immunity we don't actually feel most of them uh, anyway right so much so that if you want to look at uh, hollywood it's no wonder that they have a separate genre for for viruses and infection and i could find at least 30 movies uh, that are focused on viral infection and probably you know most of you have seen this movie contagion right so if you if you have seen this movie uh, probably there is nothing you are going to learn from my talk because you know that movie talks about everything there is to be talked about about you know this corona virus and things like that right uh, <clears throat> so with this in mind i am i have listed some top 10 uh viruses that have caused either an outbreak epidemic or a pandemic and of course the first one is hiv uh, which is there for now more than 30 40 years now and you have heard about h1n1 and h5n1 that is again a variant of influenza virus nipa hendra and sars corona and and middle eastern respiratory syndrome corona virus ebola chikungunya zika so many of these are basically relevant to us and these are all the sources for these viruses right they cross the species from some of these uh, these other animals and i have also color coded them um uh, basically the red ones tells you that they came from africa right out of the 10 only two came from china 
right? So this is, you know, we have this perception that all viruses come from China, which is not really true. And in the case of H, you know, HIV, uh, there have been close to 100 million infections and probably about 30 to 40 million people have died. Uh, but again, if you look at the duration of infection and, and then when the death or fatality happens, you know, these are very different for each of these viruses, right? And then uh, the SARS, uh, the previous virus, which is very close to the, the recently emerged virus, uh, is about 89% similar to, to the recent one. And it led to probably only less than 1,000 deaths. So it was, it was more of an outbreak or an epidemic than a pandemic. And MERS coronavirus, again, a, there were multiple events of crossing over. Uh, and this was basically a, you know, evident from sequence analysis, right? So most of the uh, crossing over happens in, uh, in, in, you know, in, in Africa, but some of them have happened in, in, in some parts of China as well, right? Now coming to this, the most recent, uh, this, uh, this SARS-CoV-2 outbreak, right? SARS coronavirus 2 outbreak. So the first patient, the first virus that was sequenced was sometime in early January. And here I'm showing the clinical symptoms. And, and when, they have, when they isolated the virus, when they looked under the you know, microscope, this is the electron microscope, M image, uh, they could see these characteristic protrusions coming out of the virus. And immediately they knew that this is, this is uh, the SARS family virus. This is a coronavirus, right? So this is characteristic of this virus. And, and when they sequenced it and um, they, they looked at the phylogeny, so when they initially they isolated the virus, they called it Wuhan human coronavirus. And later on, Chinese government asked these people to remove uh, Wuhan from, from the name. And, and basically, it is very similar to the bat uh, coronaviruses. And if you go down this tree, you can also see the previous uh, SARS coronavirus, uh, it's about 80, 86 to 89 percent identical to this, right? So this was the first virus that was sequenced. And, and almost all coronaviruses, they look like this. Um, they have this envelope, uh, which encloses um, uh, its single-stranded RNA genome, which is bound to this nucleocapsid protein. And on the outside, you have this spike protein. Uh, this is the X protein, probably all of you have heard about this. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about, uh, about the genomic epidemiology of, of these coronaviruses. So coronaviruses are basically, as I said, they are the largest viruses. They have positive single-stranded RNA virus. And, and uh, in fact, they are not the first, even the 2002 coronavirus was not the first virus to be um, um, you know, identified. The first one was in way back in 1965. and, and and the name, as I said, Corona, because of, of the crown-like appearance. And they belongs to a much of a larger family called as Nidoviralis, which has a, a large number of viruses. If you look at the genus, right, all of them, uh, or most of them also infect human beings. Uh, the good thing is they don't cause uh, much severe symptoms at all. So we don't even know in many cases that we have been infected with, for example, a torovirus, right? That's how it is. And how do people have take, trace this back to, you know, the bats, right? So when we do whole genome sequencing, uh, people basically, uh, in this case, they have done the whole genome phylogeny. They basically compare it to all other related viruses. And they found that in, in the case of the SARS, the previous outbreak, although the virus came from uh, civet, civet is, is, you know, is a cat-like mammal that is, uh, I think uh, it is it is present in China, and in some cases, in some parts of the China, they basically eat this as well, right? You can you might have seen some images of Chinese meat market and things like that, right? So basically, if you look at the tree, they have they were also able to isolate a virus from civet, and and this was very close to uh, human the strains that were isolated in humans. But most of the other strains were basically are from the bats. And they inferred that uh, these viruses also originated from bats. And, and bats are known to you know, 
host a large number of coronaviruses. They themselves are not impacted because they have a very unique, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, their immune system. Uh, but but a lot of these viruses are are there and uh, you know in, in these uh, in the bats, right? So basically, people have inferred that the first SARS virus came to human, although it came from civet. Uh, and these civets acquired from bats, right? That's how it is. And and as I said, coronaviruses are the largest RNA viruses. Uh, if you if you look at this, um, I think you have to look at. Uh, only the viruses that um, that these RNA viruses, and they have the largest genome. And what you see here at the top of this this plot is all the bigger uh, DNA viruses that we work in the lab, right? And if you look at how the genome is organized, uh, basically it has a 30 kb positive strand RNA positive strand. Simply tells you that this is uh, translation ready. As soon as it gets in, it is ready to go, right? It can bind to ribosome and start making protein. So uh, much of the uh, DNA is, uh, much of the genome is basically uh, dedicated to making non-structural proteins. So there are two proteins, polyprotein 1A and 1B, uh, 1AB or 1B. So this makes this uh, RNA dependent RNA polymerase helicase and, and many other proteins or smaller peptides that are required for basically replicating the RNA genome. Uh, so what Kiran, is unique? Yeah. Sorry, yeah. you have two to three minutes left. Yeah? Okay. So what is unique about this virus uh, is that um, it has proof feeding mechanism as well. And if you look at the genomic epidemiology of SARS-CoV-2, uh, as soon as the novel coronavirus emerged, uh, it has been basically diversifying into many different species, uh, and what stands out from this uh, this this phylogeny is that one of the variant, which has D614 G mutation, in the spike protein seem to be a lot more prevalent than the others. People believe that uh, this is exhibiting some kind of selective sweep and all. I don't have really you know I don't have time to go through all of that. And if you look at India, we have about 300 whole genomes. And again, in India also, this, um, this D2G mutation uh, is more prevalent. And, and, and this data is hosted by one of the companies uh, that is incubated by time. And again, if you look at the cryoium structures, I will not go into all the details. Uh, basically, this is the trimer uh, of, the, of the spike protein. And, and its major function is to go and bind to the AC2 protein. AC protein to, to establish infection. So we have also done some work on the evolution, you know, we have done some evolutionary analysis to show that uh, animal up and spike proteins uh, probably have a better chance of evolving much more rapidly, right? Uh, so I, I'm not going to all the details as we don't have time. Now coming to the drugs that have been discovered um, or people are repurposing, one of the things that people and you know made a lot of news was this chloroquine and hydrochloroquine, right? So this particular drug basically is, uh, you know, is, was used for inhibiting um, a, a malarial parasite uh, uh, growth. Here in this case, they thought that it can basically somehow uh, inhibit endocytosis of the virus, but most clinical studies have shown that this is not really effective. And there is another two drugs uh, that are basically used for HIV protease inhibition. And there is also a protease made by coronaviruses that are important for cleaving the polyprotein to make functional domains or functional proteins. And again, they found that um, uh, you know, these two drugs are not really effective. And there is another chem chemostat mesylate. You know, this drug has been tested uh, in Japan. And this binds to a serine protease that is basically part of the cell receptor that is required for, for internalization of SARS-CoV. Um, and again, this, uh, there is this another drug. This is basically made for Ebola virus. Uh, this is a nucleoside analog. Uh, uh, and in this case, it was also able to inhibit RNA polymerase activity. Right? So there are one or two drugs that are positive. And monoclonal antibodies, of course, they basically uh, sequester the virus particles by binding to all these uh, you know, uh, you know, spike proteins. Whereas in the case of plasma from patients, 
recovered patients. People are not sure because in some cases they were successful. In many cases, patients, you know, they, they could not have, they could not find enough antibodies to basically uh, 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 you know, sequester the virus, right? So this is where it is. Um, I will stop here and if you have any questions. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Kiran. I thank for everybody. Um, thank you. So, okay. So, first, I will take two questions from uh, YouTube, and then we can go to the questions from the uh, from Zoom. So, I will read it out. So, the question is: Can viral genome mutate even when the virus is dormant? That is, if it has not infected a host. Uh, so, you know, this is where when when the virus is outside the host, people call them as particle, right? which means that they are metabolically inactive and and the only way they can they can they can have some changes is physical modification if a virus is treated with uv for example right then it can it can basically uh, if you have a thymidine it can form dimers and basically it can distort the genome but it cannot acquire uh, a new mutation and that can happen only during the so the second question is, do the virus says have to mutate for being transmitted cross species? Are there specific triggers for these mutations apart from the animal in immune system? So specific triggers, see, you know, the mutations are basically random, right? And, and, but the selection is not, right? Because of the way, you know, in, in most of the RNA viruses, um, Per generation, they accumulate more than one mutation. And now, how does it affect the phenotype of the virus? And that is what decides whether it is selected or not. So in the case of spike protein, this is what we have seen in our own lab. Uh, so spike protein and annular protein, they can basically accumulate um, mutations independently of any other protein, right? Whereas if you look at TB replication machinery, or the protease, all the non-structural components, they actually have to form a complex. So the mutational phase that they can explore is rather restricted, right? So, it, so this entire um, ability to cross species is, is basically happens accidentally. Uh, and, and, and some of these key proteins, right? Spike protein, it is super specialized in binding to receptor and, and it can explore a lot of mutational landscapes. And, and that's how these viruses work. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sai, if you can hear me, you can ask your question. Yeah, so I, I think you answered it partially. I was just wondering, basically, um, you know, I mean, I'm also in the physics department, so you should excuse my ignorance on this topic. Um, I'm, I was wondering if uh, in all of these different mutations that you had shown for HIV, what is the kind of underlying principle with which we attack uh, the problem when we construct basically these antiretroviral drugs and kind of what's the you know what's the kind of uh, universal principle that we can then carry over to design of covid-19 uh, drugs as well like what's the way to think about this so you know um, in the case of covid um, only thing is now we have people have already uh, uh, you know, uh, obtain the structure of protease and they have already obtained the structure of uh, this RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So compared to HIV virus, these two proteins are evolving rather very, very slowly in this virus, simply because coronaviruses are very different in that they also have a proof reading mechanism. They don't accumulate mutations like HIV virus. So because they have a robust replication machinery, they use other strategies, as I have shown in this figure, and they have this dedicated spike protein, which, which can basically uh, change, and that itself is enough to basically you know, cross over the species, right? So because we have already solved the structure of, of, of especially coronavirus protease and RDRP, it's only a matter of time some companies would come up with some specific inhibitors. See, what people are doing right now, they are trying to repurpose drugs and, and these protease structures are so variable and probably even if they go and bind to the active site, you need to pump in a lot of these drugs, right? Uh, which, is, which is not a viable option. So it is much easier to make uh, an antiviral for coronavirus than HIV virus. So this is my opinion. 
Thank you. Uh, Devjanidhi, if you can hear me, you can ask your question. Uh, Kiran, if the yeah. uh, uh, spike protein mutates, so I, I read that a lot of antigen-based tests are targeting the spike protein, right? Some are targeting the nucleocapsid, but some are also targeting the spike protein. I mean, do you think then it is a good strategy? Yeah, so this is where, so the basically we have to look at the antigenicity domain. And some of them, again, you know, they may not change all that much, right? So if you are using a single monoclonal antibody in your, uh, in your detection kit, then if, if there is a mutation in a particular clade and probably then that is of no use. And your question is absolutely valid. We basically have to have now, right now, there are, I think, 16 to 20 different variants of spike protein. Someone needs to express all of this and, and make antibodies against them or the test whatever the existing antibody against all of them. There will be some, uh, I think their binding efficiencies will be different, I would say. And, and you're absolutely right. You know, if, if, if I think this is where uh, locally it is better if, you know, if there is one strain in India. And nowadays it is much easier to make this spike protein and somebody can actually... Uh, produce antibody for making the kit locally based on what is the most locally prevalent uh, strain. I think that's a very good question. Thank you. Okay, Nitin, if you can listen to me, you can ask. Uh, so yes, so I wanted to ask whether, uh, so how important is it to uh, know whether viruses are alive or dead? And has it become more important in like current scenario, in current pandemic? So if you look at these viruses, right? Um, um, all these viruses, many of these viruses have have originated or evolved independently of each other. Other than the parasitic nature, other than the way they replicate their genome, there is nothing common, for example, between coronavirus and the virus that we work in the lab, which are MIMI and, and even vaccinia virus. Right? They all have independent origin. Somehow, if you have a self-replicating DNA that is protected by a protein coat, you have your virus, right? So it is more of a philosophical question and we are caught in the definitions, right? Uh, but more importantly, we need to understand what is the infection cycle and where we can interfere, right? So the, our, our intervention strategies depend more on understanding the life cycle, in which case we already know but these virus seem to be a lot more stable. There are a lot of other studies that, you know, transmission uh, level studies have to be done. So not just the uh, molecular mechanisms. Right? So for me as a scientist, as a basic researcher, I have a lot more interest in addressing whether they are alive or not, but they may, the, in answering that may not help, help us uh, in, in finding cure or, you know, finding some antiviral. Thank you. Way. All right. Thanks. So we'll take the last question from Anirbandha. Anirbandha, if you can hear, just ask the question. Yeah, that uh, I thought that India has a lot of history in um, producing vaccines. Given that, why haven't any Indian lab come up with any credible candidate? While the West, many of the Western labs are already producing, I mean, doing it at the stage two trial. So where, are, where is it stopping us? Uh, so this is a very good question. I wish I knew the answer. Uh, 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 but basically, even, you know, India has a history of making these uh, vaccines. Uh, they are basically production centers, right? All the vaccine candidates, all the raw material that are required for making the vaccine are still, you know, in, was, was to be supplied by some, some company in US, right? We were just making them here, right? So... So right now, I think probably all these companies uh, that are probably waiting for some U.S. company to come up with a candidate vaccine, and, and they will scale up here. I, I mean, there are one or two places where people are actually looking at um, making vaccine on their own. Um, and, and there is so a consortium by... The, no, no, there is. There is, uh, there is a consortium that was... Uh, constituted by DBT to, to look at various types of vaccine. Uh, one was, of course, you know, how to package the spike protein, how to deliver this. And the second one is, uh, uh, of course, the RNA-based vaccine. 
but right now i am i have not heard of any large scale clinical study i i i i really don't know okay thank you okay i think here uh, i would like to thank you again thank you for uh, accepting our offer to give a talk and uh, that's a very nice and overview so i would ask uh, now manoj to upload your or share your screen hello everyone yeah i have to wait yeah so kiran has to stop share just one second yeah yeah so yeah meanwhile yeah thank you shomo devjani for putting this together i think uh, yeah really good to have uh, manoj you can share now i think yeah really good to have such a forum where we can discuss uh, these issues and very timely uh, so i am going to talk about uh, a pooling scheme that we have been working on uh, called tapestry pooling and uh, this work began at iit bombay uh, but at that point uh, i think we didn't have permission to do any experiments on campus and graduate students were away more importantly so we had to find partners at uh, ncbs and instem in bangalore and also harvard medical school not mentioned on the first slide but i will show you the collaborators on the last slide so yeah ha uh, okay so the you know, everybody wants you know lockdown to be eased we want normal life for at least i think most of us want normal life to resume some economic activity to begin so that you know the stresses caused by this lockdown uh, can be yeah can be released uh, so really the only option to do that is uh, to test many people and uh, the main reason is that there are many people who get covid but uh, they are asymptomatic for many days and they are spreading it and when they are not identified they can spread it to like hundreds of people uh, so how do we test all of them uh, in india the situation is exacerbated because our test kits are running out all the time so of course you know many new companies are coming into this but if you go to a testing lab and talk to them they are always in the fear that the kits will run out they are waiting for the next shipment to arrive so that they can take care of the samples that are piling up so it's a real worry that test kits are running out and so that has meant that icmr has had to be very selective about who gets tested that has meant limited testing that has meant complete lockdown that has meant economic hardships so pooling of course has been a promising technology because pooling says that with fewer tests we can get more results we can save test kits and maybe we can do something about this uh, tapestry pooling is a new kind of pooling i will show you soon how it compares to traditional pooling uh, so it's a single round pooling uh, so in a single round of pcr you get results for every individual sample and uh, roughly this is a number to remember if about 1% are infected then you can test uh, thousand samples in as few as 100 tests yeah the numbers are not exactly this uh, give or take a little bit but this is uh, yeah something easy to remember yeah and uh, yeah so this will give you savings in kits time and effort yeah so this is uh, i would say our advertising slide so let's get into the details a little bit and see sort of where the gains are what the difficulties are and what the opportunities are so uh, if you have not thought about this carefully you might think that this is what pooling is pooling means you take a bunch of samples you put them into one tube and then you test this tube and then you get to know who is positive who is negative that's not how it works exactly so if this test is negative then everybody is negative that's uh, uh, because we trust that pcr is a very sensitive test so it won't miss positives Uh, and that works uh, fairly okay for uh, you know some range of n if this test is positive then everybody has to be retested you don't know which individuals are positive and so either you want to just quarantine all of them if you are okay with not knowing who is positive or you want to do n tests more yeah so in the worst case this is going to be 1 plus n so n plus 1 tests okay so to make pooling work this is what you have to do two round simple pooling you test a bunch of pools every pool that is positive you test every individual in that pool and then you get to know who is positive who is negative and if you do this kind of pooling on the 
you know, thousand samples and one percent are infected, you would require about two hundred tests, roughly. Yeah, uh, for the best two round uh, pooling you could do here. Uh, if you try to do tapestry pooling, the way it is different is that you would send every sample to three tests, and every test gets uh, a completely different combination of samples. And in a single round, you would observe which tests are coming out positive, what their quantitative scores are. You would try to solve a bunch of equations and recover the viral load for each sample. And based on that, you would be able to tell not only who is positive and who is negative, but also the the viral load of every sample. Okay, so that's what uh, tapestry pooling can do. And roughly, we see empirically that it requires about half the number of tests as simple pooling. And it works in a single round. Yeah. Okay. So again, for people who like things more visual, so we have a pooling matrix which says these are the samples, these are the tests. So this matrix, the check marks indicate uh, which samples go into which test. So sample one goes into test one and uh, test number five. Sample uh, n goes into test three and test t. So in tapestry pooling, actually there should be three check marks per column. Yeah. So every sample goes to three different uh, tests. Okay. Um, and you look at which test is positive, which test is negative. Just based on who is negative, you can eliminate all samples in negative tests. Yeah. That's already a game. And now you all the tests that are positive, you try to find samples that are positive that will explain those tests, not just giving one positive per test, but making sure the numbers add up, right? Yeah. So uh, the idea here is you represent the test values by a vector y. So y1, y2 to yn. You represent the viral loads by a vector x, x1, x2, xn. You set up a system of linear equations, ax equals y. Now a is uh, a wide and short matrix. That means that uh, this system of linear equations is underdetermined. So you don't have a unique solution. But if you give side information that x is a sparse vector, which means that most of its entries are zero, uh, then it turns out that uh, you don't need many uh, equations. You don't need many tests to recover x uh, uniquely. In fact, you only need k times log n tests, where n is the number of samples, and k is the sparsity, the number of non-zero entries in x. So k times log n tests are enough to test n people and find k positives. So compare this with n tests for n people versus k log n for n people. And you can see that the gains are maximum when we are at a very low prevalence. If we are testing like, you know, 1000 people and uh, two people are positive in that, I can do that in 20 tests. Yeah, I don't even need like 100 tests and so on. Two people are positive in 1000, just 20 tests is what is needed. Yeah. Okay, and uh, right. So, so this is the basic idea for an engineer. This should be uh, something you might have seen either in statistics. You might have seen this as sparse regression. You might have seen this in signal processing as uh, compressed sensing. So, this is an idea that keeps coming up. You minimize an L1 norm uh, between you know AX and so AX minus Y L1 norm minimized, and that turns out to minimize the L0 norm of X. So, you get a sparse solution. And uh, of course, there are some uh, features of our particular problem which don't fall into the classical compressed sensing setting. We want A to be a 0, 1 matrix. The noise model is multiplicative noise on Y and not additive noise. And uh, yeah, so, so because of these uh, slight difference, so we have formulated the noise model based on uh, how PCR works. And uh, so, so we have three questions before us. How do you come up with the noise model? How do you design the A matrix? And given this noise model and this kind of a matrix, how do you do the recovery? So these are sort of the three places where we have made contributions, coming up with the right noise model, coming up with the right design for the A matrix, and coming up with recovery algorithms. OK, so how does this compare with simple pooling? So simple pooling tells you which individual is positive and negative, with essentially you know more or less the same false positive, false negative rate as ordinary testing. Now. You may say it's slightly worse if pooling is not done well and so on, but let's grant this for now. Uh, conserves uh, RNA extraction and testing kits. 
it's already been deployed in USA, Germany, maybe also in Israel, uh, requires the same amount of pipetting. Every sample gets pipetted once. Yeah, uh, it's a multi-round process. So if you if you have a traditional PCR setup, it's going to take you four hours to do you know one PCR round. If you have to do two rounds, one after the other, then that's going to take you all day. Yeah, and this is one reason why simple pooling, even though it has such great properties, it's somewhat unpopular in the field. The people actually doing testing uh, don't like uh, doing simple pooling because they test a sample in a pool. If the pool comes out positive, they have to go back to their refrigerator. They have to take out the sample again, extract RNA for that sample again, put it in a PCR machine. It takes too long. It means the technician has to be there all day. It means somebody has to again wear their protective equipment, again go to the hood. There is no nice pipeline that uh, this is integrated into right now. Yeah. So, so yeah. So there are disadvantages to simple pooling. What about tapestry pooling? Uh, so, yeah. So. It can be designed in a way. Simple pooling works, you know, up to six, seven percent prevalence. It doesn't work above that, and it gives you certain savings. And the savings are not uh, sort of you cannot sort of realistically expect to do like thousand samples in twenty tests and so on. So tapestry pooling works great at very low prevalence rates. It can even be tuned to work at fairly high prevalence rates, like ten percent and twelve percent. It doesn't save a lot of tests there. But it saves enough that you know you might want to do it. Yeah, uh, yeah. So and uh, it can reconstruct viral load if that is any good for you. If you think that it is, it has some clinical correlates, and you are seeing outcomes being related to viral load. This is data that you are collecting. It might prove useful. Yeah, there are one or two papers that say that one strain of COVID, which is more contagious, turns out to have higher viral load, and so on. But these are all, you know, this is emerging research, and it's not yet very clear what one should do with viral load. Yeah, uh, yeah. So every sample gets tested twice, and if it gets picked up twice, then chances are we are going to pick it up. Yeah. If it gets picked up thrice, we will pick it up. If it gets picked up twice, chances are we will pick it up. So this means that we can afford occasional misses. And those misses might be because uh, something went wrong in that PCR. It might be because of some pipetting errors. I shouldn't uh, sort of overemphasize this, but there is some error uh, correcting properties in tapestry pooling when you do it this way. This makes it somewhat robust. Yeah. Uh, again, false positive rate can be tuned. If you are okay with a high positive false positive rate, which might be the case in certain uh, situations where all you are trying to do is uh, make a decision on quarantine or whether somebody should report to work or anyway you are only using this as a screening and you want to do a second round testing. Yeah. In that case, uh, you can tolerate a high false positive rate. If you are going to use this in sort of a lab setting, you want to say, "I don't want false positives," then the gains will be less, but this can still be done. Yeah, uh, and we still conserve RNA extraction and testing kits. It's a single round of PCR, so you don't have to go back to the sample in the refrigerator and then take out RNA again and so on. So the disadvantage is every sample goes to many pools, so. How many uh, can go in one pool is limited by you know how much volume you are able to get in there and so on. These are some technical constraints which are not fundamental, and we are hopeful that there will be ways to work around this and work with bigger pools. Uh, so we have to pipette more. So every sample goes to three different tests. So we have to pipette. The time to pipette increases by you know uh, almost a factor of three, maybe two and a half or two because. You can quickly pipette one sample thrice faster than it takes to some pipette three samples. Okay, uh, so what do the numbers look like? So 70 samples we can do in 21 tests, tolerate prevalence rate of almost six percent, and uh, the pool size will be about 10, and about 210 is the number of the number of pipettings is always three times number of samples. Uh, so the yeah, so the numbers to watch are these three columns more, mainly. So yeah, about 200 samples in 45 tests at 4.1% prevalence rate. Uh, about 400 samples, 63 tests at 2.5% prevalence rate. This is sort of 1,090 at 1%. Yeah. Okay, we have done some experiments with our collaborators at NCBS and at Harvard Medical School. So this one was done at NCBS, where we took 40 samples into 16 pools according to a matrix that uh, we gave them. 
and these 16 test results came back to us and we used these to recover who was positive and who was not. And this was repeated sort of five times, once with no positive, once with one positive, once with two positive, once with three, once with four. And all five were given to us. We did not know which was which. And for zero, one and two, we got all 120 samples correct. Every, each and every one of them was correctly classified. And this was our main experiment. So we also sort of did a stress test uh, where the stress test involved, uh, okay, maybe that's not here. We also tried it with the four and five samples. And there we were able to show that, you know, we are still able to recover with a few false positives. We avoided false negatives. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the one of the experiments at Harvard put 64 samples into 24 pools and uh, three samples were positive. So I, this is not right. I apologize. So three samples were positive and we were able to recover all three samples, all 64 samples, we were able to classify all 64 samples correctly. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, yeah. So more recent experiments, we put 120 samples into 40 tests, correctly identified all the 120 samples. So 1140 samples in 90 tests with 11 positive. Uh, so this is a large number of samples. And because we are sort of pipetting everything thrice, that's like more than 3000 pipettings. You might imagine it would be a real pain to do by hand. Luckily, our collaborators had a liquid handling robot, which did this whole job in just 18 minutes. And we could correctly identify all 11 positives. In fact, we returned 14 positives of which three were false positives. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so there is this uh, graceful failure that uh, we have built into the algorithm where uh, if the num actual number of positives is more than what we have designed it for, then the way to think about the scheme is more like simple pooling. It only tells you what could be positive and then you have to test it again for confirmation. And this happens automatically. So if I'm thinking that prevalence rate is going to be 5%, but it turns out to be 10%, then you think of my scheme as an adaptive scheme. Instead of giving you uh, 10 positives, it will give you 20 positive, 20 possi likely positives and you have to retest it, yeah? But uh, the hope is that this will happen infrequently. Most of the time you will be able to correctly uh, label the samples, yeah? So positives, negatives, and undetermined. This is what we return. And we would hope that most runs will only have positives and negatives. Uh, the, the matrix is sparse. Every column only has uh, three ones uh, and uh, robust. There is some kind of uh, error correction built into it. Yeah. So we are currently in clinical trials where we are doing two sizes uh, with actual COVID sample. One is uh, 45 pools, 105 samples. It's a fairly conservative size because uh, labs were concerned that they would want to be able to deal with as high as 10% prevalence rate. So we gave them this very conservative size. Uh, and so these are ongoing. Uh, so how does, what are the use cases? So this 4505 might be suitable in some kind of, uh, uh, in some kind of laboratory settings, maybe not in a place like Mumbai right now where it's crazy high prevalence rates, but in places where the infection is uh, maybe not, not yet emerged or even among those people live they can separate, they can segregate the population into sort of uh, people who are going to have high prevalence rate and low prevalence rate, then this can be used for the lower prevalence rate population. Yeah. So the, another test is the same sort of 45 can test 200. And you can imagine this being used for hospital staff for daily testing for maybe guards at the airport, police personnel, delivery personnel other high risk population, you know, who come into human contact every day and could be potential super spreaders or, you know, where apartment blocks are quarantined, you can imagine that these apartment blocks, people could be tested in a single run of PCR and instead of quarantining, you know, everyone, of course, right now we have moved to quarantining like one floor or something, but if you test, that's better than anything else. Yeah. Uh, so we can test 400 tests with about 63 for, for so two more minutes, maybe. Or uh, yeah, so this one could be appropriate at an airport where you could get a liquid handling robot and deploy it to test like thousand samples in like 90 tests. And uh, we have built an Android app, which tells the technician what to pull into what. 
and the test results go into the app and it solves and tells you which samples are positive. So the actual protocol of implementing tapestry is no more difficult than doing uh, the simple PCR experiments. Yeah. Um, okay, so I think this is the team. So Ajit uh, is in computer science here, faculty member, is an expert in compressed sensing. Tabia is my PhD student and many undergrads uh, from CS and E and other departments who have helped a lot with writing the code. Uh, Shop 101 helped us make the phone app. Uh, NCBS in STEM did some of the experiments. Reese Institute, Harvard did some of the other experiments. And I think I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Manoj. I thank for everyone. So, uh, is there any questions? So, I do not have any questions from the YouTube channel, but maybe there is someone who can ask questions here. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So, how far are you from real implementation in the, in the, I mean, on the war ground? Yeah. So, so we are currently in clinical trials. We so NCBS has gotten passed. You know, they've gotten all the permissions. They have started clinical trials. We have two more partners, <coughs> pardon me. So one is Tata Memorial and another is Malabar Cancer Center. Both of them have submitted the proposal to their internal review boards. So whenever that permission comes, they will also start testing. Now the tests themselves are not uh, very time consuming. They can be done very fast. And if permissions come for all three centers, we could even be done by end of the month. If not, uh, whenever permissions come, whenever we do it, uh, and then based on the clinical test, we can sort of see what to do with it, who to take it to, how to get permissions for deployment and so on. And that is a place where, you know, I would, I am, if anybody has any experience in that, we, we need help. We don't know very well exactly how to navigate this whole regulatory, uh, yeah, I mean. I mean, I mean, given that NCBS director, he himself is there. Yeah, yeah. So lots of people, lots of people are interested. Uh, but I don't think any of them have gone through this whole regulatory pathway either. In fact, many people seem to think that ICMR is the one who does the regulation. At least on paper, it seems to be sort of this uh, drug controller general of India and not ICMR. But it seems ICMR has some role in this. And I'm very confused about all this. I'm not sort no, of very confident. I mean, is one of the advisors, right? Who is connected yeah, yeah, yeah. to NCBS. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 yes. So, all these people are on board. We can, we are leaning on them for help, and we will lean on them, you know, to add strategic points. But if somebody has, you know, somebody knows how regulation works in India, uh, we do need somebody like that on the team. So, please reach out. Thank you. Okay, Mithun, you can go ahead and ask the question. Yeah. So, I just wanted to ask, Manoj, you said something about this uh, robot which does the pipetting and that brings down your pipetting time. Is that something that is also scalable or when you actually implement in the field, the pipetting will have to be done by hand and thus limit probably the sample sizes? So, so as you see, right, it takes like a ridiculously small amount of time if you have a robot and the errors are very less. Uh, so if we could have a few robots at strategic places, I think that could make a big difference. Uh, I don't, so I don't think it can be deployed everywhere. Definitely. It's not a solution for every lab and every situation, but to the extent that we can get robots to the extent that we can deploy them at the right place, it could be a great solution. Now the other sizes up to size like 500, 600, you can have multiple people pipetting and you can still get down, get the amount of pipetting required time required to about manageable times okay more than you're used to you're, if you're used to five minute pipettings and so on anyway if you are going to test 500 samples it's not going to be five minute pipetting you can get it down to like uh, less than an hour and so on with multiple people pipetting yeah but uh, yeah even a few liquid handling robots i think can make a big difference okay if Kieran, Kieran, I have a question. yeah yeah so Manoj? yeah Kieran. So, so does the app guide the technician or the pipetter in real time? So uh, I should have added screenshots of the app. Uh, so what the app does is uh, you say how many samples you have and you give some indication of what prevalence rate you are expecting. Based on that, the app gives you options of, you know, what matrix, pulling matrix to use. 
uh, and you choose that pooling matrix, then uh, sample by sample, it tells you which are the tests that sample, which are the wells that sample goes into. It tells you what wells to prepare with the master mix, which are the wells that sample goes into. And uh, then once you're pooled, then you do your usual PCR protocol, you get your CT. Once you get the CT, you add that into the app in the results screen, and then you press uh, send or enter or something, and then it, it displays the results, which are, which samples are positive, which are negative, and what are their viral loads. Okay, so there is another question from Divyanidhi. You please go ahead and ask the question. Divyanidhi, if you can hear me. Okay, so I'm reading her question. So she asked, since this is a confirmatory test, am I right in thinking that we can leave with false positives since they can be retested? Not having many false negatives is a big advantage of this method. Uh, so is it on chat? Let me also look at Yeah, yeah, just read it. I don't know. And she said she is unmute. Huh. So, yeah, so, so I think she means not confirm, she means a screening test, right? Since this is a screen, so is it a screening test or is it a confirmatory test? I think that is part of the question here, right? How do you want, and that's a question about strategy. It's a question about how do you want to deploy it? So now, you know, uh, yeah, we are building a tool. Now, what is the right way to deploy this tool is itself a strategic question and one has to think about it. One has to think about uh, sort of whether to deploy this as a as a screening tool or as a confirmatory tool. I am personally in favor of deploying this as a screening tool uh, for you know these very large uh, numbers and very low prevalence because it has huge advantages. There. But it can also, as I said, right? It, there is flexibility. It can also be made to work at high prevalence and with high probability. It will sort of tell you, so with ac clinically acceptable sensitivity and specificity, it will be able to tell you that uh, these samples are positive, these samples are negative. Good. I think that was our last question. If there is no urgent question, let me thank Manoj again. Thank you, Manoj, and uh, for coming and giving this nice overview talk. So I asked Mithun to share your screen and we can start it. So you should be able to share. Yeah, I'll just uh, share one second. Uh, am I audible, by the way? Yes. Just share. Okay, so yeah, is this visible? It's visible. Okay, please go. Huh? It, yes. Okay, please carry on. Yeah. All right, so thanks, Shomu. Uh, hello, everyone. So today, uh, what I'll uh, do is I'll talk about a compartmental model uh, analyzing India's experience with COVID-19. So this is something that Sai and me, we have been working on during the lockdown in collaboration with a very large number of people, in uh, particular, Professor Abhijit Maji from the Civil Engineering Department, a group of very dedicated undergrads and postgrads who've been working throughout the lockdown. Um, and external experts, in particular, Dr. Giridhar Babu from the Indian Institute of Public Health, Bangalore, and Dr. Tarun Bhatnagar from the National Institute of Epidemiology Division of ICM. So before we get into the model, I want to give you a very basic introduction to epidemiological modeling. So lately in the news, we've been bombarded with a lot of numbers um, and terms like r naught. So where do these numbers come from? So the very basic framework from which these numbers uh, emerge is what is called this SIR class of models. So I'll give a very brief introduction to that. So let us say I want to predict the time course of an epidemic at a country level. Let's say I want to predict it for India. As we'll see later, the country is probably not the best choice of geographical unit for these models, but let's go with it for now. So in the SIR model, what we do is that we divide our population into three compartments, the susceptible, the infected, and the recovered. And the recovered in this terminology means both people who have recovered from the disease and those who have succumbed to it and have therefore been removed from the population. So the populations in these compartments can be described by coupled differential equations. 
And all these differential equations are saying is that basically a susceptible person can become infected if they come in contact with another infected person with some transmission rate, with some transmission coefficient beta. And an infected person can recover with a recovery rate, which is given by gamma. So it's a very simple set of equations. So if I now solve these equations for some particular choice of beta and gamma, then I would get curves that look like this. So let me focus on the red curve, which is the curve for the total number of infections. So the number of infected people initially grows, it reaches a peak, and then it starts falling. So what determines the nature of this infection's curve, and hence of disease progression? So if I focus on this equation for the I compartment, you can see that the initial behavior of this I of T curve depends on this factor beta S minus gamma. Okay, so if I take I common from here. So this is encapsulated by this quantity that's called the basic reproduction number, R0, which is defined as the ratio of this beta into S at time T equal to zero, divided by the recovery rate, gamma. So if this reproduction number is less than one, then the number of infected individuals falls with time because this delta i becomes negative and the disease never reaches a pandemic. So that is this pink curve over here. So that is the case when your R0 is less than one. If on the other hand, this reproduction number is greater than one, then you'll get an initial rise in the number of infections. And then ultimately, of course, it reaches a peak and falls down. To what height it will reach, so what is the peak infect infection number? That depends on the choice of your parameters, so beta or therefore R0. Okay. Now, depending on the disease that you're interested in modeling, you can construct variants of this basic SIR model with additional compartments. I've just listed some of the standard models over here, and there are many great reviews available if you're interested in reading further uh, about this. Now, one of the major drawbacks of these class of compartmental models is what is called the well-mixed assumption. So what this says is that this form of these evolution equations, what it implies is that it is equally likely for any person in a susceptible compartment to meet any other person in the infected compartment. Now, this is obviously not true for a large heterogeneous country like India, for example. If I'm an infected person sitting in Mumbai, it is impossible that I will meet a susceptible person in Delhi, for example. So therefore, for the predictions of, so for the predictions of models like this to be sensible, the basic geographical area that you apply it to must be smaller. So if you make a district level or a state level model, then this well-mixed assumption becomes better and better. But as you make it smaller, of course, then you're left with separate units that you must connect to each other if you want to build up projections for the entire country. And so I'll talk about how we attempt to do that in our model. So with that very brief background, I'll now turn to the model that we have. So before I get into the details, here is an overview. So what have we done? So we have built a district level model for India. It uh, generalizes the SIR type of model to accurately mimic the disease progression for COVID-19. It includes eight stratified compartments because we know that the disease severity is different for different age brackets. It explicitly models lockdown because that is something that India has implemented. Very importantly, we incorporate uncertainties and heterogeneities in the testing rates. So like Manoj just spoke about, uh, we know that you know testing is a major concern and we also know that different states are testing at different rates. So we need to build that heterogeneity into the model. We incorporate a transportation matrix, uh, which tells us how different districts are connected to each other. And I'll explain about that in a bit. We incorporate Bayesian techniques to make predictions with requisite uncertainties. And finally, we have an open source code, uh, which is written by all of these students, and that'll be available uh, for peer review. And if you want to play around with it, or if you want to extend it further, and so on. All right. So what's the basic model structure? So here's the basic model. We have the susceptible compartment. From the susceptible compartment, you can go into one of two compartments, the E, who are the asymptomatic and the A compartment who are the pre-symptomatic people. So this asymptomatic people, the compartment E, never show significant symptoms over the course of progression of the disease. The pre-symptomatic people initially don't show symptoms, but after some mean incubation period, they will become symptomatic and go to this I compartment over here. Um, as you know, as uh, Kiran uh, spoke about, one of the challenges in battling COVID 
has been that a large number of people are asymptomatic, but they're nonetheless infectious. So we need these compartments in order to accurately model the progression of the disease. So from the pre-symptomatic compartment, you go to the symptomatic compartment I, and from this I compartment, you can recover and go to this R bin. Note that you can also recover directly from this asymptomatic bin. So you never actually show any symptoms. The virus runs out its course and you ultimately recover. Okay, you go to the R bin. Note that I have this additional compartment sitting in the middle, which I call this P compartment. What this does is that it contains people who have been tested positive for COVID-19. Um, we know that we are not identifying all the infected people. So the people that we do identify, we move to this P bin. Note that you can get to this P bin from either the symptomatic, the asymptomatic, or the pre-symptomatic bins with different rates, of course. So what this compartment P does is that it reflects inadequacies in the testing rate. Okay. So the data that you do have for the country, you try to match it to the population of this P bin over here, because these are the people that you have actually diagnosed. All right. And finally, in the bottom half of this image over here, you'll see I have these different X compartments. So what these X compartments are is that they model the population under lockdown. So excess models, the susceptible population under lockdown, XA models, the pre-symptomatic population under lockdown, and similarly XC and XI. What is important to note over here is that even under lockdown, transmission continues to happen but with a reduced rate, which is given by this beta one. So beta one is a factor that lies between zero and one. And it tells you something about the effectiveness of the lockdown. If beta one was zero, then during lockdown, there would be no transmission. Whereas if beta one was one, then your lockdown would be completely leaky and therefore completely pointless. All right, so now we take this basic model structure and we replicate it for three age groups, below 20, between 20 to 60, and about 60. So each district that we model is represented by these three age groups. And the dynamics in each of these age groups is represented by this basic model structure. The populations in these different age groups come into contact with each other via a contact matrix, which was taken from this previous study in 2017. And this contact matrix, what it does is that it accounts for contacts at home, contacts in the workplace, contacts in schools, and all other social contacts as well. The different districts are connected to each other via this transportation matrix, which was uh, developed by Abhijit Maji and his students. And I'll tell a little bit more about that. But what this transport matrix does is that it connects this working age population, so this 20 to 60 age bracket between districts. So that's the model. Uh, so we have differential equations describing the time evolution of each of these compartments. I'm not going to show the equations, but I'm happy to discuss them at the end if any of you are interested. So note that we have 10 compartments over here. And for each district, we have three age stratified groups, which means that each district has 30 compartments or 30 differential equations. We have some 700 odd districts in India, which means we have around 21,000 couple differential equations, which we then solve to generate the predictions for the country as a whole. Okay. So I'll just flash the model parameters here. Note that mostly these are taken from what is known about the disease progression for COVID. For example, it takes roughly five days for symptoms to appear and so on. The only two free parameters that we have is beta, the transmission coefficient, and beta one, which is the leakiness of lockdown. And these are the only two fit parameters. So we fit that to available data, the number of positive cases, the mortality, and the recovery data. All right, so now we come to the transportation matrix. This was developed by Abhijit Maji and his students Sandipan and Sushma. So what they do is that they take the latest census data, so the 2011 census, uh, for the working age population in every district of India and the tripling distributions of these workers to estimate how many people travel between district A and district B in a given day. So what this does is that it allows us to connect different districts or states in a reasonable fashion and understand how mobility plays a role in the spread of the disease. Also, what it allows us to do is to study the effect of heterogeneous interventions. So what would happen if you impose lockdown only on a single district or on a single state? All right. Um, so next we come to the testing rates. We know that we are not detecting the true number of infections, right? Because our tests are limited by availability and policy and so on. 
Further, we also know that this testing inaccuracy is different for every state because each state is testing at different rates. So unless we have some estimate of this, we cannot really make projections for the future spread of the epidemic. So what we do is that we use the ratio of the observed mortality, the number of deaths, to the observed number of recoveries in order to gain an estimate for the true number of infections. And I'm happy to discuss this in greater detail. We do this for Kerala. Why? Because Kerala, according to the National Health Mission, the Kerala healthcare infrastructure is the best in the country. So we say that, okay, we can trust the mortality data that is coming out of Kerala. We then compare this estimate of the true infected numbers to the reported number of cases to obtain a testing fraction. And what this analysis tells us is that Kerala tests roughly one in 2.5 infected people. So for other states, because the data may not be reliable, we come up with an empirical estimate. We scale the other tests, other states' testing fraction but from the Kerala value using their health index score from the National Health Mission and the number of tests per million for COVID that that state has performed. So here is the number of state tests per million. Here is the health index score from the National Health Mission. So we use these two values to scale the testing fraction for each state. And just to give a sense of what this means at the opposite end of the spectrum from Kerala, what it says is that Kerala tests, of course, one in 2.5, as I said, but West Bengal, on the other hand, tests one in 38 infected people. So this testing heterogeneity then gets reflected in our model through this P compartment. The final piece of the model is what is the Kalman filter. Uh, we use an extended Kalman filter approach to trajectory estimation. So this is basically a predictor predicted type of algorithm. What it does is that it allows us to take partial measurements, so reported number of cases, mortality, recovery, and make predictions for the evolution of the system as a whole with some error estimates. And again, you can look, this is a standard thing in measurement theory. You can look this up if you want to know more about this. So with that, I would like to, I would like to show you some very brief results from our analysis. Please keep in mind that you should not take these numbers that I will show as the gospel truth. Um, and all the usual caveats of compartmental models still apply, but still the trends should be, should be informative. So I'll show you results from three scenarios that we have simulated. In the baseline scenario, the lockdown, the national level lockdown ends on 3rd May, and you have normal life resuming after that. In intervention one, again, lockdown ends on 3rd May. Schools and colleges remain closed till the end of June, but states now try to increase their testing rates, but increase by how much? So we come up with a graded approach. We divide states into three baskets, depending on their health index scores. We say that let the top third of states move to Kerala's testing rate, let the middle half move to half of Kerala's rate, and let the bottom third move to 25% of Kerala. So what this does is that it tries to come up with an achievable target rather than saying that I'm going to increase testing infinitely, which is somewhat utopian. So this is a modest proposal, but we'll see what is the effect of this intervention. And the final intervention that we study is what is called this heterogeneous or local lockdown scenario. So again, the national level lockdown ends on 3rd May, schools and colleges remain closed, but we reduce work and transportation contact matrices to 50% of their base values. So this is nationwide. So life resumes, but it resumes at a reduced rate. Also, we lock down a state if the number of people who have tested positive in that state crosses 0.01% of the total population of that state. Just to give a sense of what that means, that would mean roughly 10,000 people diagnosed in a state like Maharashtra. This is a somewhat strong intervention uh, because of this imposition of this reduced work and transport uh, matrices and because of this local lock lockdown, and we'll see the effects of this as well. So let's first look at the national level picture. In the no intervention scenario, which is this blue line, the total number of infected people reaches almost 35% of the population at peak. Okay? And the peak is predicted to occur around end June to early July. If you implement enhanced testing, like I described, you bring down the level uh, of infections to around 25% of the population. So even this modest increase in testing uh, reduces the infection count by around 100 million. The heterogeneous lockdown, on the other hand, with this reduced work and transportation matrices, it has a very strong effect. 
it shifts the peak of the infections curve further down the line. So it hasn't yet peaked by early August. And the number of infected people at this point of time is only around 5% of the total population. So even without a national level lockdown, but merely by imposing strict controls on physical distancing, on work from home, and on transportation, we can do actually very well in containing the epidemic. And a similar, so that was infected numbers. If you look at projected mortality numbers, you have the similar trend in the mortality as well. In the no intervention scenario, we have a prediction of around 170,000 uh, predicted mortality at peak. If you implement enhanced testing, that number comes down to 100,000. In this heterogeneous or local lockdown scenario, that comes down to around 25,000 at uh, near the end of August. So the message is this, therefore, that as transport opens up, as lockdown is lifted, you should expect a spike in cases. And depending on how serious we are as a country in enforcing physical distancing uh, protocols, this spike can actually be fairly devastating to the nation. So let me now look at a couple of states uh, in a little bit of closer detail. So let's first look at Kerala, because Kerala is you know, our model state in some sense. So if you look at this curve in this top, the inset of the curve in this top left over here, this shows you the data till 3rd May, okay? so till lockdown was on. So while lockdown was on, Kerala was doing very well. Right? It was bringing down its number of infect, infect, infection numbers. And this red points over here in the inset is the actual data. However, once you lift the lockdown, which, uh, is, which is shown in this main plot over here, and so therefore you allow mixing from other states, which may not be doing so well in testing. What you see is that the numbers bounce back right up. And this is what is called as the second peak. And for the second peak, the infection numbers at peak is roughly around 5 to 6% of the population. If you look at the now the increased testing scenario, remember that Kerala is not increasing its testing. Other states are trying to increase their testing to bring it up to as close to Kerala levels as possible. But because of this transportation matrix mixing the populations up, this improvement in the performance of other states gets reflected in the improvement in the performance of Kerala as well. So the numbers now come down from 6% to roughly 3% at peak. And intervention two, which is this very strong intervention is of course very good. It basically prevents the second peak from almost showing up. Also note that in this uh, intervention, two, Kerala never needs to go to lockdown. Mithun, That's because sorry, never... uh, sorry okay. to interrupt. So you have three to four minutes. Okay. okay. It never crosses the 0.01% threshold that we have implemented. And these trends are also reflected in this mortality projections that we have in this bottom line. So let me now turn to a state at the other end of the spectrum, West Bengal. Because West Bengal's testing rate is so low, the effect here is much worse. In the no intervention scenario, we see that the projection is that around 50 to 60% of the population is going to be affected at peak. Uh, this is the actual number. The number you actually test is going to be much lower because your testing rates are much lower in West Bengal. If we introduce enhanced testing, which is this curve over here, you do dramatically better. You now have only about 30% at peak. In the heterogeneous intervention, this intervention two, West Bengal itself doesn't do too well because its testing rates are so poor. But what is good is that because it goes into lockdown, so the shaded region is when it has gone into lockdown over here, because it goes into lockdown, it does not, the poor performance of West Bengal does not affect national outcomes because this is now cut off from the rest of the country. Okay, so that's the, that's the strength of this heterogeneous lockdown or this heter uh, heterogeneous lockdown scenario. Uh, so I'll briefly just flash the results for Maharashtra because we're sitting here. What does this say for Maharashtra? For Maharashtra in the no intervention scenario, the peak is projected to be around 25% of the total population. And it's estimated to occur around mid to end July. So this is why it's somewhat concerning, you know, to me that we are seeming to be sort of trying to open back up, even to reduced extents. Um, the situation today is actually much more dire than when we had started the lockdown. And while, you know, it's understandable that we have lockdown fatigue, the data does not really support any sort of reopening in the Bombay region. If anything, it calls for much more stricter uh, physical distancing uh, measures. Uh, so before I end, because I said this is a district level model, we have district level results for the whole country. So these are district level results 
for two particular dates, um, 3rd May and the 15th May. And these simulations were run using a heterogeneous uh, scenario, using the definition of this red, orange, and green districts that have been put out by the government. And what, it allow, what the simulation allows us to do is that it allows us to see how these districts fare with time as time progresses. Uh, and this has been run till 15th May, but we have data post that as well. I forgot to look at it. OK, um, so what have we learned at the end of the day? Um, so in some sense, what we the message is this, that national lockdowns are difficult and, and extremely resource intensive to enforce. They, of course, come with a tragic loss of life and livelihood as well. But the effect of this lockdown is that it has shifted the peak of the curve. So earlier, maybe if the peak would have happened in May, now it will happen in end June or end July, unless with no other measures being taken. So unless you really implement enhanced testing or some other, maybe we develop a vaccine, all lockdown can do is that it can shift the peak of the infections curve further down the line. On the other hand, Local lockdowns are somewhat smarter because it takes the solution to where the problem is most severe. It allows normal life to continue at a reduced pace. So you still have to do all this physical distancing, masks, hand washing, and so on. But it allows some form of reduced uh, activities to continue in the low risk zones. Finally, in order for this lockdown to be effective, you must have greater resources to scaling up testing and humane quarantining in high risk zones, such as Bombay. So, and that is where these um, things such as smart cooling can come into play. And this is how a lockdown can actually made to be uh, made to be effective. So unless you do testing and unless you do quarantining in high risk zones, the situation is, is going to continue to get worse and worse. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I think I'll end there and I'm happy to take thank, thank, Thank you, Mithu. Uh, I, I care for everybody else. Uh, so we'll take questions. So first I take the question from the YouTube chat. So let me just read it out. So there's a question. It says that for scaling up tests, would there be a way of incorporating the quality of the test deployed or the kind of test used? I, I cannot hear you, Shomo. Uh, oh, you cannot hear me? No. Now, yes. can you just... No, okay, sorry. Uh, so the question from the YouTube chat is the following. For scaling up tests, would there be a way of incorporating the quality of the taste deployed or the kind of taste used by each state? Or is it reflected in the NH ranking? So what you could say is that, so for example, um, if you have somewhat of a better test or a worse test, or you know, like Manoj was say, saying that, you know, if by doing 100 tests, you manage to test samples for 1,000 people, those numbers will get ultimately get reflected in these testing dates. Uh, that we calculate over here. So these testing rates will reflect the quality of tests in some sense. Um, we don't, right now, that is not something that is implemented, but if necessary, that is something that could be calculated and incorporated into the model. Okay, thank you. Uh, if there is a question from someone in the Zoom, you can ask, you can unmute yourself and ask. So. Okay, so there is a, in the chat box, there is one, so you can read it or I can read it for you. So this is a Vishet from the ME department. Can this compartmental model... Again, louder, Shom. What is wrong? Uh, this is a Vishet from ME department. Can this... Oh, there is a question by Varun. Let's take the question of Varun and then we'll take the next Okay, question. sure. So you said that uh, this is something which you are about to publish. Um, have you actually already submitted this for peer review? No, uh, so we are planning to at least put it up uh, on the archive, uh, hopefully in the next week, and we'll then submit it for peer review and see. Uh, what and the second thing is that, uh, do you have a channel through which you have uh, taken this to uh, decision makers? Uh, so, well, so we have, um, like I said, we have collaborators um, at ICMR and at IAPH um, who act as consultants to various state governments and the national government. So as and when these people have asked us for some projections, we have tried to give it to them. How much it has affected, we don't really know. So we have not directly been in touch, but uh, through our collaborators, yes, we have tried to. Um, okay, can I have one more question yeah. from you? Oh, yes. please go ahead. Okay. So, um, 
another test for uh, such kind of a model would be that if you uh, rewind if you go yes. back a month uh, limit yourself to data up to there yes. and test it against how you are faring with uh, today's right. actual numbers so actually just before the talk today i wanted to test that so the state level simulations we had drawn on the 3rd of may so assuming that we had data till 3rd of may right um, so if you see the data points it ends around 3rd of may uh, so we, i just wanted to go and check how we are doing and i checked that for maharashtra and it seems we are actually doing fairly well uh, let me just Uh, see if i can pull up the numbers uh, so it's been maybe not one month but it's been uh, about three weeks or so um so we predicted it would be around 40000 uh, the reported number the p compartment and i think the data for maharashtra is around 35000 great thanks but again i want to say that uh, i would not be uh, in some sense i'm not really Two A about whether it's thirty-five or fifty, as long as it's not fifty or as long as it's not ten lakh, as long as the order of magnitudes are correct, I think we are roughly okay. Because one of the main motivations was to test out what sort of interventions might actually be useful, rather than say that this is the exact number that we are going to get. Of course, it should still make sense qualitatively, but uh, I would not really put too much value on the exact numbers. Okay, we have another question from A Ranjan. Yes. Yeah, so I have made myself uh, audible, I think, so I can read the question. Yes. So I'm a faculty in mechanical department. So I have been uh, looking at some data from the ward level, uh, and I have uh, noticed that the data has been, um, I mean, very dynamic. So the situation in different wards seems to be very different. So I was wondering if your model can be applied to different uh, at a ward level for Mumbai. Uh, And I, if the region is small, smaller, I think the the results could be more accurate, and that's what uh, I'm curious about. Okay, so let me answer. So there are two things, right? So as you go smaller and smaller in your units, the mixing assumption becomes better and better. But on yes. the other hand, these in some sense are statistical models, so yeah. the averaging assumption becomes worse and worse. Okay. Uh, so the average projections become worse, and so in some sense, it's, it's fails at a statistical level. um but also at a more prosaic level getting uh, if you want to simulate the whole country at a ward level that becomes difficult because then you have to get populations age stratified populations for every ward so even getting for every district the students have to work really hard to dig into the census uh, get all of that data out format it and so on and so forth um yeah. so at ward level it becomes difficult but on the other hand i would say if you are interested in ward level and one should be instead of doing models like this there is a different class of models which exist which are called agent based models where you actually model each individual as a particle in your model and then say that well how does individual a interact with individual b and so on so these can be scaled up to let's say 100 100000 people 200000 people and so on so you can actually do these very detailed simulations at the ward level and as far as i know there are two groups in the country that are trying to do it for bombay one is a collaboration between tifr and uh, isc uh, which is trying to get ward level estimates uh, another is a company in pune called thoughtworks which is also trying to get ward level projections for bombay thank you very much thank you uh, i have thank one you. question yes oh, go ahead yeah actually recently i was looking at the world uh, data for different countries and and the ones who have already crossed the peak so there are two points one is that at the peak it seems all of them have very broad peaks not a very nice well defined maxima and falling off very broad peaks and secondly past the peak on the right side many of them showing some kind of oscillations it's not noise it's oscillation do you have any idea yeah so one of the ways that oscillations come is uh, depending on what sort of a lockdown policy you adopt so for example it is known that if you adopt a uh, periodic lockdown so let's say you say that i'll allow people to work for 3 days in district a and give the rest 4 days off whereas in district b i will allow them to work for the other 3 days and give the remaining 4 days off and so on so if you allow this sort of uh, phased lifting of lockdown in some sense that leads to uh, oscillations another way it can lead to oscillations is for example if you do this uh, even if you do not do this uh, three day three day business but if you uh, as a whole if you lift lockdown say for bombay you say that well 
I lift lockdown. Uh, I'll impose lockdown if cases go beyond ten thousand, and then once it comes down, I lift it back up. And then again, if it goes beyond ten thousand, I'll impose a lockdown. So if you have this sort of a periodic sort of policy, that also gets reflected in the oscillations in the number of infected uh, infected curve. Okay. So depending on what sort of interventions you are actually implementing on the ground, you yeah. can have oscillations in the infections curve. For example, if, the, if you look at the U.S. graph, they have just crossed the peak and now coming down through a very broad uh, uh, maxima is falling, but not sharply. You, uh -huh. you see a lockdown, but I do not know. I mean, I have not read up whether they have anything su such kind of imposed uh, periodic lockdowns or not. Yeah. So I, I, I'm not very sure because U.S. has a lot of very heterogeneous policies from state to state um, to a certain extent similar to what we are doing. So I'm not very well aware of what the exact policies they are following, but I, I can look it up. Uh, there is a question from Sumiran. Sumiran, if you can hear me, go ahead. Uh, hi, Mithun. Sumiran here. Yeah. So I was just curious, how many parameters in your this country level model you have finally? So like, a, let me flash the parameters model again. Uh, so there are many parameters, but most of these, para so the, there are only two free parameters, which is the transmission rate and the leakiness of lockdown. Some of the disease parameters are known from what is uh, known from what is known about the disease itself. For example, the mean incubation period is five days. The mean recovery time is uh, 19 days for asymptomatics, 22 days for symptomatics. So these are taken from the WHO report uh, that came out on coronavirus. So these are not really free parameters. We have not tried to fit anything to them. So we have just taken from this WHO report, uh, WHO report that came out. Um, in some sense, the only uh, this testing fractions, as I said, we have estimated using this uh, mortality uh, to the recovery data. And the only other thing that we have sort of arbitrarily put is this rate at which the population moves into lockdown, which we have put to around a week. Um, we don't really have a better handle on that, but all that will do is if it, instead of a week, it was 10 days, it would shift your peak by around three days here or there. So it would not really affect the numbers that much. It would just shift around the peaks a little bit. And anyway, given that, you know, uh, we have some error bounds in this model, it would not really matter too much. Uh, the transmission coefficient and the leakiness of lockdown is fit to the reported data at every state. Okay? So for each state, we do this fit and we estimate what is the transmission coefficient for every state. We estimate what is the leakiness for every state. Nice. Okay. Into one more question. Okay. Yes. Yeah, sorry. sorry. So is, do you see any trend towards herd immunity in the sense that as in, in the worst scenario, when the number, I mean, one of your three scenarios is the First one, I think, is the worst, no intervention, and then it No intervention, much. yes. So in those cases, uh, does any idea of hard immunity comes out right from the model? Yeah, I mean, in the sense that, uh, look, um, if I, let's look at this blue curve over here, right? Yeah. yeah. Past, so if you did nothing, and you just waited for the peak to come, so basically after this peak has crossed, the fact that this infection number starts to fall means that effectively your R0 has become less than one. Why is that? Because you simply do not have enough susceptibles left in the population for the disease to propagate. Which means in some sense you have achieved herd immunity. No, in case of herd immunity, there's also a concept that the, uh, the virus gets somewhat weakened due to some mutation or something. Some Is that- no, But that may be a long term effect, part right? of so, so this is just not something that we have looked at, that what happens if the virus mutation mutates to a less severe strain or something like that. Um, yeah, a I, I, I don't really know how to put that. Uh, I mean, what sort of parameters I would use to model that in the absence of any data uh, about the virus as such. Okay, maybe we can move on with other questions. So there is a question. Uh, can they... Oh, depends. Okay, go ahead. Yes. Uh, so, Mithun, so when one looks at these uh, infected number peak as telling you, know, so that's like at any given, on any given day, what is the maximum number of infected that you may have, right? Yes. The number, the number of active cases in some sense. Right. Now, but, uh, you know, what I find in all of these kind of uh, sort of well-mixed models in some way is yes. that... Uh, uh, the total number of people 
that are yes. finally infected if i ask that question yes that turns out to be all very huge almost close to 100% uh um, no but uh, i would say it's more like i don't know around 70 80% yeah well i mean depends upon where you cut off the data right if you go continue to go on ha uh. it inches up and uh, so for example no, so for ask, example if you think about it depend even in the basic sir model yeah yeah that is what and I and you say that well if i extrapolate it to infinity mm. what is the t tending to infinity limit of the susceptible compartment right, right. for example that is not zero that is a finite number yeah i know and okay. that number depends on what is your beta value so what is your transmission coefficient and so right on. right also it depends upon the transportation parameters and things like that in this model of course it would also yeah, depend so on the transportation i am kind of parameters. curious given that no intervention intervention 1 and intervention intervention 2 yes. we can see perhaps it will be much lower but intervention 1 and 2 yes uh, sorry no intervention and intervention 1 what is this yes. number for you so i don't have the cumulative numbers for the infected uh but i do have the cumulative numbers for the mortality um let me just uh, just give me one second let me just uh, dig that up uh so this curve uh so this is the predicted mortality that i have uh so here i have the cumulative projections actually for these two scenarios and uh, just give me one second so in the no intervention case um, you get about uh, 6 million as the total uh, mortality projected uh, whereas in the with the enhanced testing that comes down to around 4.2 million mortality total mortality i i have not i do not have often the uh infected cumulative curve but i can generate that and i can tell it to you oh. no so because the last sense why Sorry. am i trying to stress that is that at the yes. end of the day you know people's uh, common man's worry is like whether i am going to get infected now if you if you think that you know at the end of the day if the models are predicting like 90% 95% of the people are finally all going to get infected mm -hmm. then basically that message doesn't even Occurred to most of us. True. I mean, uh, either the, these kind of models. I mean, if that does not happen, yes. Then either these models, these models are, are wrong, totally missing, are, totally yeah. missing the whole point. On yes. the other hand, you know, if if But that is to happen. then you know people should uh, <laughs> at this point get no no but you know, this is probably uh, something about the model itself right so you also got to know no but yeah this so, model always predicts 100% population always more or less that's, that's over the, the long term over the long term okay. yeah 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 if you waited like long enough and yeah, so, so on uh, and no vaccine it. emerged yes. and Yes. nothing happened eventually yes of course people Everybody. would so the hope is that somehow you keep pushing this peak further and further and by that time some credible right. vaccine candidate emerges or like anirban was saying that maybe the uh, virus mutates or maybe we are very lucky and this high humidity conditions somehow reduces the virulence of the virus and so on. right 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 so okay, we take the last question uh, sorry to interrupt you yes. yes so the last question is by kanti kanti if you can hear me just uh, unmute yourself and ask the question Sorry, is Kanti saying or are you saying? So Kanti is not. Uh, I think he went off. But let me ask his question. So is there a is there a way for the model to give its own error confidence level? Ah, so that is what we try to do, uh, Kanti, using this um, Kalman uh, filter approach. Uh, so see what what this says is basically we have three measurements, right? We have measurements for the reported number of cases the reported mortality and the reported number of recoveries uh, on the other hand the total number of variables in the model is much more so the state variables is let's say 10 because i have 10 components so uh, what this kalman filter then tries to do is to sort of uh, say that what is the trajectory that will firstly lock on to this reported uh, number of cases mortality and recovery and then going forward it also tries to generate error estimates uh, uh for the projections uh now 
the problem is that these numbers are so high that the error estimates don't even come into the scene. But uh, maybe if I can show you uh, a different plot, uh, which was a district level plot. Uh, is this still visible? Uh, yes. So this was one of the district level simulations, for example, for a district in Karnataka. Uh, this is the uh, district of Udupi. This green curve over here was the projection. Uh, the, the shaded region is the confidence interval that we uh, have in the projection itself. And this is something that the model is built into the model. So we automatically also generate error estimates. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, OK, and so now it's working fine. Uh, so so yeah. there are only two free parameters, that beta and beta 1. Right? Yes. Uh, everything else is input data. So uh, maybe the uncertainty can come from the input data as well as uh, if the guesses of beta and beta 1 are not right. So by error estimate, what I meant is that if there is a slight perturbation in either the input variables, any of these input variables, mm -hmm. by how much the prediction actually came. So we've done a sort of, kind uh, of an estimator. yeah, so we've done a sort of, uh, that is something that we're still doing actually. Uh, so we have, we've tried to do a uh, somewhat sensitivity analysis for these different parameters. Mm -hmm. um, so it appears, for example, uh, see the disease progression parameters we have not really played around with because that is what is known, it is what is known. Uh, what we've played around with is, is, for example, this rate of lockdown imposition and lockdown lifting, and that does not make much of a difference. Uh, the transmission coefficient is, of course, sensitive. Uh, so the results are sensitive to changes in the transmission coefficient. It's not that sensitive to changes in the leakiness. So the beta 1 parameter, of course, if you change it a lot, the results change. But small variations, it tolerates fairly well. Um, also, uh, just to give you a sense, uh, roughly the beta 1s that come out is in the range of 0.5 to 0.7, uh, so where 0 is perfect and 1 is completely leaky. So even with this national level lockdown, we've not been ex we've not been doing extremely well. But the uncertainty in the input data because the number of input data is quite large. Yeah, so that is something that we, in principle we could input. Uh, we have not yet done it. So what the approach we have taken is that whatever data we have is correct. That's obviously not true. Uh, I know because there is so much issue with data reporting. Uh, but so one of the okay. So let me say that of course we have incorporated test uncertainties in this. Uh, testing rates, right? So which gets reflected back in the number of infections. But for example, if there are if there are errors in other data as well, uh, that uh, in principle we could take into account, but we have not done that yet. Okay, okay. I think yeah. uh, that's uh, I have to stop here. Thank you very Sorry, much. Sorry, uh, can I just uh, question? Okay, yes, I, okay, go ahead. Uh, I think Sai, I heard first. So Sai, Sorry, uh, yeah, I, I just want to quickly Sai, think, uh, ask it offline because it is your project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I just <laughs> wanted to add to uh, the the wonderful talk that Mithun has given uh, and share with uh, uh, Kanti as well that uh, uh, Kanti the um, uh, the mo the mortality rates and the number of positives we actually have a, a, a covariance matrix that actually has the errors uh, in them and so we model them as Gaussian errors so. In fact, we are quite uh, uh, we are quite capable of already folding in the uncertainty in the reporting as well. So this is just a point I just wanted to add. Okay, thank you. Right, thanks, uh, Anil. One. Yeah, yeah. Vidhu, I had one short question. question. Very short. Yes, yeah, short question. I mean, I, so the national data. I see the mortality rates are very different from state to state. So what does that that so what is that, you, that is a reflection of the testing rate, in fact. So, for example, if you look, West Bengal's mortality rate is very high. Why is that? That is because it's not detecting enough infections. So it's only detecting those infections which are very serious, and therefore a lot of them are dying. No, no. But for, if you look at Gujarat, high number of uh, testing, high infection, high mortality also. So, um, see. The, the, so the, and they are talking about different strains of viruses and so on. Ah, so that is of course one possibility. Uh, that is not something that we have taken into account. Uh, so in that sense, if if that were to be the case, that in different regions, different strains were active, and that actually has very different uh, mortalities, then the projections of this model would need to be revised. Uh, just once more. Can I just can I just add one comment? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Please go ahead. Uh, Mithun, this yes. on Onirban's question, I have been also thinking for the past one week 
that yes. period is about 7 days and it's across various countries what is 7 days sorry can you just repeat that, that oscillation yes after it passes the peak yes. in various countries you can look at it is between 5 to 7 days i see and that period is very mysterious it's almost appearing everywhere i don't think they are periodically enforcing anything there is something very interesting here i see maybe weekend act in weekend people move less or something it could be weekend. i don't know yeah it could, uh, something, could be something like that there, there is some so natural could be effectively a lock because what are you doing in lockdown in lockdown you are reducing your contacts with other people so right, could be right. that you know during these uh, weekends or something there is drastic reductions where people are not going out and mixing in movie theaters or so on and so forth and but i don't know i'm just speculating wildly here right, right. that's something that's interesting actually I one comment on dibendu's question that yes with <laughs> 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 so, no, comment person, the disease as long as yes. at a given time not many are infected that's okay it's like yes. pox so again so that is one of the things that you do not want to over so right now in bombay for example your hospitals are completely crowded you cannot get admitted even if you have covid right so the aim okay, is to sort of bring the numbers down enough that at yeah. a time your active cases do not overwhelm the healthcare infrastructure yeah right Uh, I think sorry, Dimundu and and Anirvanda, uh, I have to cut <laughs> it short here because we are going. To work thank, you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you again, you. everyone, to join for Thanks joining. Shomo. Thank you, thank you, Kiran, thank you, uh, Manoj, and thank you, Mithun, for joining also. And uh, hopefully, we'll continue this kind of symposium again in in few days and so on. So good. Good. Uh, thank you very much. I will stop the stream uh, at this point, and and thanks for joining.